But once ecstasy arrived at the Hacienda, um, it, it, the club was transformed within about three weeks. And it was almost, uh, I mean, it kind of started under the, as a DJ overlooking the Hacienda dance floor on the balcony. And, and it started uh, bottom right under the balcony uh, and went that way in a period of about three weeks, I would say from probably the 1st of February till the third week of February 1988. And by the end of February 1988, the, the, not everyone was doing ecstasy by any means, but ecstasy was in the air. Ecstasy was the drug that was fueling the night. In the same way that alcohol can fuel a night where not everyone's pissed. You know, you don't have to do drugs in order to feel that. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and, and so, again, that kind of changed everything, really. And you were never inclined to, to take it? Well, I mean, I've taken drugs, but when, uh, when you DJ... I mean, some of my colleagues uh, would quite happily tell you stories about doing drugs and DJing. Uh, but it doesn't always work. And, you know, for me, I kind of, I, I don't know, I just, um, okay, this is like, this is the, this is... This is the bit we edit out. This, yeah, edit this bit out. T.S. Eliot, he talks about um, the still point of the turning world, which is, for him, is kind of like a religious thing. And that is how I felt as a DJ. I felt in that time that I was that still point. I was that, that point in the club where everything revolved around what I was doing. And I'm not meaning that, you know, the still point is not more important than the turning world. But, uh, and without what was happening, I'd have been nothing. But uh, I, I was that still point, and everything else, you know, the, if you imagine the, ca the chaos, I mean, it wasn't just the Hacienda, I did the, I did the night at the boardwalk in Manchester for about nine years, and I've been in some really, really chaotic situations. You know, I've been in situations where there's people with guns in the club, I've been in, in situations where, uh, you know, there's, there's all kinds of violence, there's uh, known gangsters, there's TV camera crews, there's, you know, uh, women voluntarily taking all their clothes off, uh, you know, all sorts of people getting blowjobs, people throwing beer glasses, all that. There's chaos. And that's just in one half an hour on a Thursday night. Um, and you, but you've got to keep it together, you know. You, 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 you just do what you do. And uh, uh, and so I don't think I would have been helped if I'd been off my head, really. And 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 uh, you know, and I still I still uh, you know I still feel that. So uh, it, yeah, it was a, it was a very odd experience because you, you're kind of as a DJ anyway, you're you're involved, but you're involved in a totally different way to the audience, you know. Uh, and you see everything from a totally different perspective to the audience. Um, but at the same time, you have to, it doesn't matter if they don't understand you, but you have to understand them absolutely 100%. You have to be inside their heads. Just thinking about your involvement in music, I've got a mate here tonight, Tony over there, who's got a question for you. And he's been, he, 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 you messaged me last week, said, would it be all right to mention this? And I said, yes, of course. How much do I owe you, Tony? <laughs> Play hard records. Uh, okay, so uh, it was a record label that I ran. Uh, well, I say I ran it. I mean, God. Um, it's okay to do things when you don't know what you're doing, it's basically. It's do you know what I mean? I'm just saying to you and everyone else, hey, it doesn't matter. I am busking constantly. Do you know what I mean, if you want, you know, if you, if you want to cook tea for somebody and you think you can't cook, fuck it, cook tea yeah, for them. Fuck it, yeah. uh, and it was a bit like that running a record label, basically. And it, but it was, a, it was a, for me, 
I did I did my fanzine and through my fanzine I, I, there were lots of um, bands particularly around Manchester who weren't getting record deals so I did flexis flexi discs and uh, given away free with a fanzine and um, they were fantastic who did you have on then? who was on your flexi discs? Um, dub sex, twang, laugh First ever in Spiral Carpets release, wow. um, and then uh, then obviously I'd occasionally again go bonkers. Uh, there was one time where I recorded the sound of the fanzine being printed at the printers <laughs> and put that on a flexi. Two years later, loads of people were dancing around it. <laughs> it was the greatest. It, is, it was thing it was quite minimalist yeah. and repetitive. Um, but I, you know, I think we do have the right to be pretentious. Um, in life, so um, and one of the one of my proudest moments was uh, listening to the, John Peel was a fantastic influence on me. If you talk about what who influenced me as a DJ, it it, it was absolutely John Peel. And that's where that eclectic thing came in, and uh, and uh, he was also really supportive of the fanzine. And there was and I used to send him a copy of the fanzine, and I remember and I would listen in. Anyway, but I'm particularly listening if I just sent him one, and he, I can remember him saying, "Oh, uh, I've, I've just got a, a, a new, the new issue of Debris, De Debris Dave." As he called me, not Miserable Dave. Debris Dave has sent me the new fanzine. Oh, there's a flexi. These are always good. I'll put it on. And he literally put it on. He opened the envelope, took out the flexi, put it on without listening to it. And it was that one. Because he because he must have trusted me. No, it wasn't, it wasn't the machinery. I think it was Dub Sax. Um, anyway, so the rec record label was an extension of that, basically. And um, I think I shouldn't have done a record label. No, you definitely should um, I did a band called King of the Slums, who were fantastic. Uh, but wankers, basically. <laughs> Worse than that, wankers with an Alsatian dog. <laughs> oh, no, he ain't a wanker with yeah, an Alsatian dog. Yeah, because then if you've got a wanker with an Alsatian dog, what can you do? You're on the back foot, aren't you? They come to a meeting with an Alsatian dog, and you're like, yes, your single will be number one. Don't worry, leave it with me. And, hmm? Yeah, they did. That was, yeah. They did Bombs Away on Harper Hay. And... Um, yeah, they were difficult people, but they were um, they were on Snub TV. They did a, they did a brilliant performance on Snub TV. Uh, anyway, so I had various bands, but it was my the problem really was I was I was enthusiastic for the bands and I wanted the bands to do well, but I really didn't know how it all worked. Um, and then um, yeah, I don't regret it, but it wasn't yeah, it wasn't the best moment. What was the what was the song that you were at? What was the tune that you? Yeah, there was a there was a rapper called MC Busby, and he was he was good. He we put out a couple of his records, but what always happened with us was we would put the records out, and because John Peel was you know supportive, he'd play them. Uh, at that time, the NME were quite supportive, so they give it a really good write up. Simon Reynolds would do a full page in Melody Maker. So most of the things we put out were like top five indie singles, which really means fuck all. But the bands would see that, and then they would march in with the Alsatian dog or whatever, and would. I actually remember King of the Slum saying to me, coming in, and I'm like, uh, top five NME single again. And they're like, yeah, but Bruce Springsteen's on the cover. And they, like couldn't, and they thought they were better than Bruce Springsteen, which on some level they were. And they couldn't understand why they weren't on the cover. And um, so all the bands then decided that uh, they should be more famous and more rich and should go off somewhere. So MC Busby, bless him, uh, we put a couple, couple of singles out by him, and he decided he needed a manager. He did need a manager, to be fair. But the only person he knew who had any money or authority was his landlord. <laughs> and so he, who happened to be a car salesman, 
who sold vintage cars on Peter Street. So Busby walks in one day and he's like, um, his manager was called Charles. His, his, his uh, car emporium was called Charles of Manchester. And so Busby walks in and says, this is my manager, Charles of Manchester. <laughs> and he wants to know where all the money is. And I'm like, it's not gonna work. Anyway, he got signed to Polydor and then dropped. As often happens. As often happens. Shall we take some more questions? Because, you know, we've got a bit of a... We've got a really nice audience, yeah. really good audience. And, yeah. and they're, they're quiet so, and they're taking it all yeah, in. Yeah, but we always... And then they're going to buy a copy of the book. Of, of course. Absolutely. Everybody's going to buy a copy of the book in here. And how many copies have you got, Dave? Have you got to get rid of tonight? I can... If I don't sell any more, I can still walk out with my head held high. I don't need your love and your money, I'm but sorry, it would be one. lovely. I've got 20 to sell, and I've sold four so far tonight. Hello. That was not meant to be funny. It wasn't, yeah, we're not joking here. You've got to buy one. Yeah, you Yeah. Right, somebody, yeah, go on over at the back over there. Sorry, sir. Do, do you take card for the booth? <laughs> no, I don't. No. Well, I'll take your card and give it you back next week. The cash machine just down there. But uh, cash is preferred, or your card and your PIN number for a week. Up to you.